In this episode, we'll discuss the events that occurred in 2014. 31-year-old Carly McBride disappeared under mysterious circumstances after visiting her ex-boyfriend's house. After receiving a missing person report, the police began an investigation. However, it took the authorities almost two years to answer the question, where did Carly disappear to? Carly was born on April 14, 1983, in the family of Steve McBride and Lorraine Williams. She was a cheerful and outgoing child with a close relationship with her parents. Growing up, Carly started experiencing more and more problems. She started abusing alcohol and illegal substances. Nevertheless, she made efforts to overcome these harmful addictions. In 2014, Carly was a 31-year-old woman that lived in Belmont, New South Wales, Australia. She was a mother of two children, seven-year-old son William and three-year-old daughter Cadence. Carly's children were from different men, but I couldn't find any specific information about her relationship with her former partners. However, we know that Andrew Easton, Cadence's father, was one of the last people to see Carly. In 2013, Carly checked into a rehabilitation center to overcome her addiction to illegal substances. While there, she met Sale Kenneth Newson, the friendship with whom gradually grew into something more. From August 2014, Carly and Sale started spending almost all their time together. The couple had fights sometimes, but they seemed to be happy on the surface. On September 30th, 2014, Sale took Carly to Muswell Brook, where her three-year-old daughter Cadence lived with her father, Andrew Easton. Carly came to stay with her for a few hours. She entered the house of her former partner at about 12.30 p.m. Sale didn't stay with her, but they agreed he would return in a few hours. However, when Sale came to pick up Carly, she was no longer there. Carly's ex-partner, Andrew Easton, said they fought, so Carly left. She planned to go to the nearest McDonald's, located about a 20-minute walk from Andrew Easton's house. Puzzled that Carly didn't call to tell him where she would be waiting for him, Sale started calling her himself. Since all attempts were unsuccessful, Sale drove towards McDonald's, where she allegedly planned to go. Along the way, he looked around, hoping to find Carly sitting somewhere waiting for him. He suggested her phone was dead, but Carly was nowhere to be seen. She wasn't at McDonald's, where she supposedly went, or anywhere near it. Sale drove around the streets of Muswell Brook for a while, but it was in vain. Carly seemed to disappear into thin air. When she didn't return home to Belmont that evening, Sale contacted the police. The detectives asked him the details of what had happened. It would be exactly the same thing every time. I would drop her off, she would get out and go to the front door, she would have her daughter in her arms and turn around and wave me off, Newson said. She would ring me twice and text me twice every visit to let me know she was okay. But on that day, I dropped her off about 12.30 p.m. and things were just different, and I didn't hear from her again. Not a thing. I texted her, I called her, but the phone just rang out. Newson said he turned up at the house about 4.30 p.m. as usual to pick up Carly, only to be told by her ex that she had left after an argument earlier that afternoon and headed on foot towards a McDonald's restaurant about one mile away. Undoubtedly, the following question arose. Did Carly leave her ex-partner's house or Andrew Easton was hiding something? His story suggested he was the last person to see her. However, no other witnesses could confirm that Carly really left his house. Police interviewed neighbors and people living along the route Carly would have taken if she had gone to McDonald's. The fact that no one saw her has further increased suspicions about her former partner. Unfortunately, no surveillance cameras near Andrew Easton's house could confirm or deny his words about Carly leaving around 2 p.m. After reviewing the recordings from the surveillance cameras at McDonald's, the investigators found no evidence she was ever there. Police searched fields behind a nearby residential area for clues. However, a chief investigator of this case said nothing particularly remarkable had been found, adding that the investigation would continue. They urged anyone with information about the disappearance of Carly McBride to contact the police department. She was last seen wearing blue jeans, sandals, and a yellow t-shirt, and she was carrying a tan handbag. After obtaining a search warrant, the police examined the house where Carly was seen last. A group of police officers went there, 
hoping to find clues that could shed some light on what happened to the mother of two children. But after searching Andrew Easton's house, the police did not find new clues. Nothing there indicated that someone committed a crime in that house. However, investigators did find something suspicious. They discovered Carly's Facebook account got deleted a few hours after she vanished, before the official report of her disappearance. This mysterious deletion of her account on a social network raised a lot of questions. Are the account deletion and Carly's disappearance somehow connected? Was she the one to delete her account, or did someone else do it? Why was the account deleted? Perhaps the Facebook messages could tell about what happened, and that's why someone deleted the account. To get answers to these questions, the detectives turned to the U.S. Department of Justice, hoping the latter would help restore Carly's account and determine who could have deleted it. Facebook data analysis is done at the company's headquarters in Menlo Park, California, but Sergeant Wright said Ms. McBride's Facebook friends could help New South Wales police. We're asking if anyone may have been in contact with Carly via Facebook or any other social media in the days leading up to her disappearance, if anyone noticed anything unusual, if they could come forward and let us know, he said. Given the timing of the Facebook page being shut down, and in the context of the disappearance, we think it's hugely suspicious, but it's also something that could hold some vital information about what happened to Carly. Carly's parents didn't believe their daughter had just fled to start a new life. Close friend and flatmate Carly Smith said nothing appeared out of the ordinary as she spoke with Carly on the phone as she traveled to Muswell Brook. She was so down to earth. I would call her a free spirit. She was easygoing. She just loved life, Miss Smith said. She was always there for her friends. If you were having a bad day, she just knew, and she would be in contact. And she also made a plea. We all wake every day not knowing what happened, not knowing where she is, she said. You have to have a conscience. Come forward with some news. Just give us something. The police thoroughly searched the area where Carly was before her disappearance. The search included dogs, police divers examining the Hunter River and its surroundings, and aerial and trail bike patrols. And yet none of this helped to find any traces of Carly McBride. Months passed but the investigation did not bring any results. Carly didn't leave any digital footprints. After she disappeared, she never turned on her phone. Her social media accounts were inactive, and she did not use bank cards. Investigators began to assume that Carly was no longer alive. Nine months after Carly's disappearance, her parents sought help finding their daughter. They were joined by Detective Timothy Seymour, who could contribute by requesting any information helpful to the case. Ms. McBride's mother, Lorraine Williams, shed tears during the public appeal and begged for help to find her beloved daughter. If you know anything, even if it's the smallest thing, please come forward and help us, she said. Steve and Lorraine said their family experienced difficulties after Carly's disappearance. We are coping the best we can, Mr. McBride said. As far as Carly's children are concerned, it's a fairly complex area. Both children have two different fathers, and to be honest, we haven't had too much close contact with those children. So we're just hoping that changes so we can have further contact with them. Detective Inspector Timothy Seymour said officers had worked tirelessly since Ms. McBride's disappearance. We have a plethora of information that we are sorting through. However, we are still appealing again, Inspector Seymour said. The breakthrough moment may come from somebody who might think they have an innocuous piece of information. Over time, Carly's parents started realizing that they would probably never see their daughter alive again. Lorraine wrote a heartbreaking letter addressing the man who robbed her of her daughter. I don't believe there is one person who does not now know what happened to my bub or hasn't noticed what has happened on that fateful day. Please help us for her children. They are innocent and gorgeous babies. Whoever you are, you have taken their mummy away. They are lifeline to fun times and happiness in their lives. They are tower of strength. They will never feel her soft, warm, and reassuring kisses and her big, warm hugs with that big, contagious belly laugh of hers and her radiant smile. Their memories are lost. They cannot say goodbye to her. Our pain, anguish, angst, and frustration are keeping us all down, causing us to wake up super vigilant that we might get a call to say they have found my bub 
Whoever you are, you decided on that day to rip my daughter away from us, you bottom-feeding runt. We are left with question after question after question. We don't know how to grieve or what we are grieving. We are in a kind of grief limbo. Our little beautiful poor babies need to know where their mummy is. They are the innocent victims in this horrible nightmare we are enduring. Please someone come forward so they can move on and grow into the amazing people their mummy would have wanted them to be. We can't honor and respect Carly's life until she is found. My daughter is reeling you in and you will be a fine catch when you least expect it. This is my only wish, that we find my bub, that we can put her to rest. It is a basic human right with the dignity and respect that she deserves. Then her babies and their beautiful but broken hearts and heads can start to heal and they may have a life without the anguish and pain and angst. You didn't give my daughter a chance. Please give her children the knowledge they ache for. William and Cadence should not be burdened with this pain. Please help us give them some semblance of grief and loss in their journey. Carly is a proud Aboriginal woman, as is her beautiful sister, and I am proud and honored to be their mother. No one deserves this in life, but my baby is reeling you in. You are breaking while we are aching. Your truth is Carly's truth and in turn is our truth. Please someone speak up. Since the police couldn't link Carly's disappearance to her ex-partner Andrew Easton, they turned their attention to another potential suspect, Sale Newson. During the investigation, they learned that the relationship between Carly and Sale was far from perfect. The man was very jealous, which was a frequent cause of their fights. Despite their relatively short relationship, Newson told everyone he was deeply in love with Carly, mentioning she was the first woman he had fallen in love with in the last 14 years. He desperately asked for any information, participated in launching a Facebook page, offered financial rewards, and knocked on every door in the area where she was last seen. But notwithstanding these public statements of love and devotion, Newson almost immediately started intimate relationships with other women. Besides, a few hours after reporting Carly missing, he offered sexual intercourse to several women. Carly disappeared on September 30th, and on October 2nd, Sale spent the night with another woman, but in public, he behaved like an inconsolable guy who had lost the love of his life. Detectives also discovered that Sale and Carly had an argument two days before her disappearance. The reason for this fight was Facebook messages that Carly allegedly received from other men. However, all this was only circumstantial evidence. They needed direct links to bring any charges against Sale Newson. In April 2015, the authorities searched properties at three addresses, one in Muswell Brook and the other two in Scone. Scone is a town in the Upper Hunter Shire in the Hunter region of New South Wales, Australia. The distance from Scone to Muswell Brook is about 15 miles. During the searches, they seized three firearms and an unspecified amount of illegal substances and arrested a 24-year-old man, James Kaneen. However, the police stressed that the charges weren't related to the ongoing investigation into Carly's disappearance, and yet they did arise during this investigation. Thus, we should keep this name in mind. Almost two years have passed since Carly was last seen alive. The police continued to investigate, but there were no new clues to help solve the case. But then, suddenly, there was a breakthrough. On August 7, 2016, in a rural area near Scone, two local pedestrians found the remains in a shallow grave in a bush just a few feet from the road. Forensic examination confirmed that these were the remains of Carly McBride, a mother of two from Belmont, who went missing on September 30, 2014, in Muswell Brook. The police postponed the announcement of finding her body for four days, hoping to obtain additional evidence. Superintendent Guiana repeated police suspicions that they did not suspect Carly, 31, had been snatched off a street by a stranger. We don't believe that this was a random act, so we are looking into her past and as many people as we can find, he said outside Scone Police Station. But he stopped short of identifying any suspects in the case as it is all too fresh. It has taken us two years to get this breakthrough, and we have a fairly vast volume of fresh evidence that we need to evaluate in a thorough fashion, he said. 
We have put a lot of work into this in the past two years. The team here is pretty keen to solve this for Carly's family, and we have got so much new evidence now that it is going to take a lot of work, but we are well into it, he said. The heartbroken parents have told through tears of their desperate need for answers. Please come forward with anything, anything, Lorraine sobbed. We still need to know who did this to my baby. The couple said they have had some closure now with her body being found and were extremely grateful for the police and public help to find their lost daughter. For 10 months, the investigators carried out extensive work, which resulted in the issued arrest warrant for Sale Newson. On June 19, 2017, he was arrested and taken to a police station. Newson denied any involvement in the death of Carly McBride. However, Sale Newson wasn't the only one who received charges. Police believed that 26-year-old James Kaneen was the one who helped Newson dispose of the body. Carly McBride, Sale Newson, and James Kaneen met in a rehabilitation center for people with addiction to alcohol and illegal substances. Each one left the center at different times and for various reasons, but they stayed in touch. The trial of Sale Newson began in August 2018 and protracted for several years because the police had only circumstantial evidence. Prosecutors alleged that Newson met with Carly after she left her ex-partner's house, struck her several blows to the head and back in a jealous rage, and threw her body away. Forensic experts have determined that Carly McBride died from multiple blunt force trauma. She suffered 23 fractures to her skull, 13 fractures to the torso, and spinal and rib fractures. The judge said Carly McBride suffered blunt force at the hands of Newson before she died. Judge Erase also noted how Newson had told interviewing police he was a skilled mixed martial arts fighter. His main sport was Thai boxing. I had 20 fights and 20 wins. I trained alongside world champions, but when I got really good, I got too old, he told police. I find the cause death was severe trauma to the brain due to a high degree of force to the deceased's head, the judge said. I am satisfied the offender caused death by the use of fists or feet or both or the use of objects. While searching Newson's house, police found the map in a shoebox under the bed. This map contained a drawn circle around the towns of Moosewellbrook and Scone. Carly's remains were found exactly in this radius. That map also had the numbers 1, 2, and 3 written on it in locations outside Muswellbrook, with Senior Constable Mohini giving evidence that the first two numbers marked the location of point-to-point -point cameras. After the police found Carly's remains in 2016, Newson called her father, Steve. During the conversation, Newson mentioned that the found skeleton was missing hand bones, and yet the police never disclosed this information. The only people who knew about it were the police, Carly's parents, and the Department of Forensic Medicine at the John Hunter Hospital. As the authorities believed, Newson knew about it because he was familiar with the crime scene, and he was the person who left Carly's body where they found it two years later. Moreover, the clothes on Carly's remains matched the ones she wore on the day of her disappearance. It suggested she died shortly after leaving her former partner's house. The police couldn't find her purse and phone. When police searched Newson's mobile phone, they discovered he had deleted Google location services between September 18th and October 2nd, 2014. During the trial, the investigators learned that the photo of Carly, which Newson took on the way to Muswellbrook and later used in missing person flyers, was edited and cropped even before the police received the report of Carly missing. When the search for Carly began, Newson offered a $20,000 reward for information about her whereabouts. However, his bank account showed he was broke, which meant he offered the reward only because he knew no one would ever find her. Thus, he wouldn't have to pay. Newson injected himself into the police investigation from the start, trying to deflect suspicion onto others and attempting to get information about where police and other emergency services would be searching. He also conducted a canvas of the neighboring streets searching for CCTV or witnesses, which police said was done not to find information but to suppress it and to determine if anyone had seen him intercepting Ms. McBride. And while volunteers and police searched for her around Muswellbrook and handed out missing person flyers, Newson was in Sydney, messaging friends about how he was driving an Audi R8. As well as that Newson claimed to know the area where Ms. McBride was found, 
like the back of my hand, and described it to Carly McBride's father, Steve McBride, despite only seeing footage of a fake crime scene set up by police. The images you are seeing now are not a real crime scene, but a staged one that the police used to see Newson's reaction. The more investigators dug into Newson, interviewed him, looked at his Facebook messages, listened to his phone calls, the more he shone the light on himself. After examining his internet search history, investigators discovered that he was looking for information on how to delete a Facebook account. His account remained active, but Carly's account got deleted shortly after. Although all the evidence was circumstantial, the prosecutor said they did have puzzle pieces that began to reveal a picture when put together. Eventually, these pieces turned into an irrefutable case, ruling out any other possible explanations for how Carly McBride disappeared and how her body was about 82 feet from the side of the road. The judge concluded that the motive for the brutal and unplanned attack on Carly was Newson's jealousy. After he picked Carly up from Muswell Brook, he discovered she had spent about 90 minutes with her ex-partner instead of spending time with her daughter, as was planned. Carly's daughter was not at home during that time, and the fact that she was alone with her ex-partner for an hour and a half allegedly ended with Newson attacking Carly in a jealous rage. Ms. McBride's mother, Lorraine Williams, told a sentencing hearing that she lived in a blur of grief and anxiety for two years as she waited for her happy, gorgeous, and outgoing daughter to come home to her two young children. Instead, the next time she saw Carly was in the morgue, a day she tearfully described as the worst day of my life. Carly should be here, living her life with her children, her sister, her father, and me, Ms. Williams said. After today, I never want to hear, speak, or see the man who took my beautiful daughter's life ever again. He no longer has any power to hurt me, and I refuse to think of him anymore. I will miss Carly for the rest of my life every second of every day, Miss Williams said. Almost seven years after he reported Carly missing, 43-year-old Newson was found guilty in December 2021. He was sentenced to 27 years in prison with parole eligibility in 2038. After the sentencing, Newsom turned to the judge to restate his innocence. I understand the verdict's been the verdict, he said. Your Honor, I'm innocent. From the day I reported Carly missing to this very day, I've been compliant with the police, with the courts, with the jails, everything, and I've been found guilty of a crime that I did not commit. Someone out there has committed this crime and it wasn't me. It wasn't me, and now I've got a big struggle ahead of me to try and clear my name through the courts after this. James Cunning, who helped Newson dispose of Carly McBride's body, denied his guilt. However, in July 2022, a jury found him guilty too. The judge said Cunning lied to police in three interrogations to create a false alibi for Newson and deleted data from the phone to cover his tracks. Unfortunately, I couldn't find his picture, but it is known that when Kaneen received charges in the Carly McBride case, he was already in prison for illegal weapons possession and prohibited substances. In November 2022, the 31-year-old Kaneen showed almost no reaction when he was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison with a four-year parole period. After the trial, Carly's parents said that although justice had prevailed and no matter the verdict, nothing would ever return their daughter. The Irene Cortez case, an unfortunate accident or a contracted murder of a mother of many. They say a scorned woman is capable of unpredictable and desperate acts with cold and cruel revenge being the most fearsome. But what about a scorned man? Many would say an offended man might resort to physical violence, drown his sorrows in alcohol, or combine these two scenarios. Yet men, generally less grudge-holding, can be more ingenious when it comes to revenge. The case of Irene Cortez, a Spanish citizen who met a mysterious end during a trip to Colombia, is complex and ambiguous. While her perpetrators were caught, convicted, and are currently serving long sentences, the deceased woman's family claims the real culprit remains at large and is portraying himself as a victim. Let's delve into this intricate story from the beginning and try to determine if a third party was involved, or if the murder was, indeed, unintentional. It's worth noting that each party involved is still trying to prove their version of the truth. 
Who was Irene Cortez? Irene Cortez, born Lucas, was born in 1980 in sunny Granada, Spain, the capital of the province of the same name. She grew up in a well-off family with a brother and sister. Her parents ran a small but profitable business. According to some reports, her father passed away early, but her mother, Maria Lucas, took over the business operations, expanded the enterprise, and ensured her children lacked for nothing. Maria's older brother, Uncle Pedro Lucas, was also a significant help. Irene was the eldest of the three children. A beautiful and sociable girl, she loved being the center of attention and attracted boys from an early age. Shortly after finishing school, she married and was already pregnant. At 17, she became a mother for the first time, and two years later, she had her second child. Her mother and uncle provided considerable support, allowing her to pursue a good education despite early motherhood. In the early 2000s, Irene moved to the resort city of Malaga with her husband and two children. There, she opened an entertainment venue that quickly became popular and profitable. Initially a small disco bar, it eventually transformed into a full-fledged nightclub. In Malaga, the couple welcomed their third child, and life seemed prosperous and stable. At 25, Irene's husband was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison for trafficking illegal substances. Tragically, he lost his life in prison under mysterious circumstances. The responsibility of raising the children fell solely on Irene's shoulders. Remembering how her mother single-handedly raised three children, Irene was determined to persevere. She successfully managed her business, earned well, and had big plans for the future. Relationship with Farid Henesaris Farid Henesaris, a native of Barranquilla, Colombia, was born in 1976. Growing up in a large, impoverished family, he was the youngest of his siblings. His parents separated in the early 90s when he was still a teenager. His older siblings were independent by then, and Farid stayed with his mother. In 2001, at 25, Farid, along with his elderly mother, moved to Spain in search of a better life. They settled in Malaga, where Farid took any job he could to support himself and his mother. In 2005, he started working as a waiter at a nightclub owned by Irene. Irene immediately noticed Farid's hard work and reliability. She was also attracted to him, and Farid in turn did his best to please her. At the time, Irene's husband was incarcerated, and she planned to file for divorce but couldn't before her husband's untimely demise. Irene and Farid's employer-employee relationship soon blossomed into romance. Farid wasn't deterred by Irene's three children from previous relationships, nor was Irene bothered by Farid's humble background as a waiter whose salary she paid. Within months of starting their relationship, the couple decided to move in together. They settled in Irene's spacious apartment, and soon after, Irene became pregnant with Farid's child. They went on to have two children together. It's unclear if they were officially married, but Irene kept her first husband's surname, while the children born with Farid carried the Henesaris surname. Imprisonment and Infidelity In 2009, Irene's past seemed to repeat itself. Like her first husband, Farid was arrested for distributing illegal substances and sent to prison. Once again, Irene was left alone, this time with five children. Farid was sentenced to three years, but served only one and a half being released early for good behavior and cooperation with the investigation. However, soon after Farid's imprisonment, Irina found solace in the arms of another man and lived with him for those one and a half years. Farid learned of her infidelity only after his release. Understandably furious, he threatened Irene and her lover and almost attacked the man, narrowly avoiding another legal issue. Eventually, they resolved the matter peacefully. Farid forgave Irene for the sake of their children, and they resumed living together as if there had been no imprisonment or infidelity. Irene's relatives were always skeptical about Farid. Her mother and uncle disapproved of their relationship, suspecting Farid was only interested in Irene's money. Also, Irene's older children from her first marriage never accepted Farid, while the youngest, whom Farid had raised since the child was two, saw him as a father figure. Fateful Trip to Colombia In early 2011, Irene's husband, Farid, expressed the need to visit his homeland of Colombia due to his father's severe illness. Reportedly, 
Farid's estranged father was diagnosed with advanced cancer, and his sister in Barranquilla had informed him of the dire situation. Irene, who had long wished to visit Farid's homeland, decided to accompany him. She was eager to meet Farid's father, whom she had never met, and also experienced the legendary Barranquilla Carnival, typically held in late February. Moreover, Irene, who hadn't taken a vacation for years due to her dedication to work and raising her five children, saw this trip as an opportunity for a much-needed break. The couple planned a 10-day trip across the ocean, with Irene's mother and younger sister agreeing to care for her children during this period. Despite her mother, Maria Lucas's attempts to dissuade her from the journey due to a bad premonition, Irene disregarded her concerns. At the same time, the family faced financial difficulties due to a seasonal downturn in their business. Despite this, Irene had personal savings of 3,000 euros in cash hidden at home. But on the eve of their trip, she discovered the money had mysteriously vanished, almost derailing their plans. Irene quickly borrowed the necessary funds from her uncle and close friends. She also booked their flight tickets and a hotel in the city center, thoroughly preparing for a journey that, tragically, would be her last. Mysterious murder. On February 27, 2011, the couple arrived in Colombia. The flight was uneventful, and they immediately checked into their hotel. Irene called home to reassure her mother. However, two days later, Farid informed Irene's eldest son, 14, of his mother's death. Initially, Farid claimed an accident, but it was soon revealed that Irene was murdered during a robbery at a Barranquilla entertainment venue. The case quickly became a major news story in Colombia. The narrative was that Irene, a Spanish tourist, was killed by robbers who fled the scene, triggering a citywide police manhunt. However, the circumstances of the robbery and murder seemed unusual and suspicious. The attackers did not appear to be trying to steal anything, but instead shot Irene in the heart and then fled in haste. Police and local media representatives quickly arrived on the scene. Despite the fact that Farid witnessed the shooting of his partner during an interview with journalists, he looked quite calm, not corresponding to the image of a grief-stricken widower. The Spanish embassy in Bogota confirmed the murder, adding that Irene's remains will be repatriated after the necessary investigations. The exact events of the night of March 2nd have yet to be clarified by investigators. In the meantime, authorities are actively pursuing the attackers responsible for this senseless crime. Surveillance footage. The case of Irene Cortez's mysterious death seemed to gain clarity after reviewing surveillance footage from cameras installed at the location where the murder occurred. On March 1st, Irene and her partner, Farid Genesaris, had planned to meet Farid's brother, his sister, and their spouses. The group of six enjoyed the carnival, walked around town, and then, at Farid's suggestion, went to a local bar for dinner and entertainment. By 1 a.m., Irene, Farid, and his relatives were the only customers at the bar, as surveillance footage clearly shows. Around 2 a.m., two young men sitting away from the group entered the bar. They did not order anything and did not look comfortable, which caught the attention of the bar manager because of their suspicious behavior. Moreover, their young appearance made the manager check whether they were of legal age. The young men refused to show their IDs and, when asked to leave, one of them pulled out a gun and aimed it at the manager. His accomplice produced a knife, but soon retreated out of the camera's view. The armed assailant pushed the manager aside and approached Irene's table, announcing a robbery and demanding mobile phones and cash. His knife-wielding partner reappeared, presumably to collect valuables while the gunman kept the group under threat. However, he didn't get a chance to act. Confronting Irene, the gunman ordered Farid to stand for a pocket search. As Irene reached for her purse, the assailant lunged at her with the same hand holding the gun. A shot was fired as he grabbed the purse, striking Irene directly in the chest. She collapsed to the floor as the assailants fled without taking anything. Farid and his brother chased after them while his sister tried to stop Irene's bleeding and his brother's wife called for emergency services. Unfortunately, the culprits were too fast to catch. The men returned to the bar, attempting to aid Irene but it was too late. Emergency responders arrived quickly, yet Irene succumbed to her injuries en route to the hospital, 
leaving behind a baffling case and a grieving family. The Hunt for the Perpetrators, Arrest and Trial In the wake of the robbery and homicide that took Irene Cortez's life, law enforcement mobilized all available resources. The city was teeming with tourists for the carnival, and ensuring their safety was paramount. A reward of 10 million pesos, about 3,500 euros, was announced for information leading to the culprits. The first suspect, the gunman Brian Dario, was apprehended the next day. He quickly implicated his accomplice, Juan Carlos. Juan, 18, surrendered to authorities, hoping for leniency. During interrogation, Dario claimed dire financial straits, debts, and a sick child in need of costly treatment drove him to the crime, corroborated later by his relatives. He maintained that Irene's shooting was accidental, occurring while trying to snatch her purse. Juan Carlos contended he was an unwitting participant. He said Brian didn't reveal his plans but asked for backup in a job. He claimed to have only a small knife for intimidation, not harm, and left the scene once he realized Brian's intentions. However, surveillance footage contradicted his claims, showing him returning to Brian. With both perpetrators in custody and their confessions, the case appeared solved, with prison sentences looming. The court found Dario guilty of robbery and homicide under aggravating circumstances, sentencing him to 23 years. Carlos received 17 years for complicity in these crimes. Accusations against Farid and new crime details. From the early stages of the investigation, the family of the deceased woman openly accused Farid of orchestrating the murder of his wife. Irene's mother and uncle hired a detective who conducted an independent investigation, gathering additional materials and evidence to hold the man accountable and prove his involvement in the crime. Starting with the earlier mentioned disappearance of 3,000 euros from the hiding place in Cortez's house. According to Maria Lucas, only Farid knew about this money and he was the only one who could have discreetly taken it. The woman told her daughter about this from the beginning, but she did not want to listen. Now, she believed that her son-in-law used this money to pay Dario to kill his wife. Another weighty argument was the fabricated illness of the man's father, whom he was so eager to visit. It turned out that no cancer diagnosis was made for the elderly parent, and he was quite healthy for his age. Farid concocted this story, making it the main pretext for the trip to Colombia. Also, it was Genesaris who initiated the visit to that fateful establishment. Moreover, he insisted on continuing the feast deep into the night when all the other visitors had long dispersed, and their company was alone in the hall. Further, the detective conducted a detailed analysis of those very recordings from the cameras, giving an assessment of what was happening and making his own conclusions. He noticed that the criminals acted strangely. Juan was clearly scared and, most likely, really did not understand what was happening while Brian approached the company, came up to Farid and raised him, but did not directly threaten him with a gun. It looked like the men knew each other and acted cohesively. Then Farid, strangely, moved behind Irene, who was sitting at the table. When she reached into her bag to get her wallet, the criminal with the gun looked at the man as if waiting for a signal. It's hard to say exactly whether he received any kind of sign as the victim and her husband were back to the camera. After the shot, the man chased the killer, but in the expert's opinion, he deliberately let him escape. However, the latter statement can be considered controversial as Brian was armed with a gun and Farid could reasonably fear for his life. Also in question was the man's behavior after his chosen one was declared dead he willingly gave interviews to the arrived correspondents, talked about the details of what happened, and, at the same time, did not look too upset or depressed. Another important question. Why, after the tragedy, did Genesaris call not Irene's mother, not her uncle, or any of the adult relatives, but dialed the number of her 14-year-old son to tell him about his mother's death? According to Maria Lucas, he wanted to personally inflict pain on the teenager, punishing him for not recognizing the stepfather's authority and treating him disrespectfully. The woman's uncle was the first to dare to give an interview in the press and openly talk about his suspicions and the results of the investigation. Pedro Lucas was sure that Farid planned the trip in advance, essentially luring Irene into a trap. 
The money stolen from her was used to pay for the services of a hired killer, and after her death, he planned to establish guardianship over the children and take over the business of his deceased wife. Farid's mother did not silently listen to her son being accused of a terrible crime and openly stood up for her offspring. The woman claimed that her offspring was madly in love with Irene and her children and would never harm her. However, in the end, the parent inadvertently let slip a phrase about the chosen one not having to cheat on Farid, as this greatly offended his pride. Also, an unpleasant detail emerged about Genesaris leaving Spain on fate documents, as he was not allowed to leave the country because he had recently been released from prison on parole. The man himself denied this information, stating that he left legally and Irene acted as his guarantor. Funeral Without the Widower Twelve days after the tragedy, Irene's body was returned to her native Spain. The funeral was conducted with a closed casket, as the remains had begun to decompose after such an extended period. Hundreds attended the funeral, family, friends, neighbors, and even those who didn't personally know Cortes, but had heard about the resonant story and wanted to express their condolences to the family. The only person missing from the farewell ceremony was Farid, who simply feared returning from Colombia, apprehensive of retribution. Farid claimed that the relatives of his late wife had repeatedly threatened him and his elderly mother. For this reason, before flying back to Spain, he intended to appeal to the authorities to ensure his safety. He sought a protective order to be able to attend the funeral, but his request was denied, and Genesaris decided not to take the risk. In turn, Farid filed a complaint in court against the relatives of his deceased wife, who, he alleged, hindered his return home. However, Maria and Pedro Lucas denied his claims, stating they were most interested in his return to face trial in Spain. Additional Court Proceedings With new circumstances and accusations against Farid, an additional investigation and court proceedings were conducted. Dario and Carlos, already serving their sentences in a Colombian prison, were interrogated about their acquaintance with Genesaris and a possible premeditated conspiracy. However, Brian categorically denied this assumption. He continued to insist that the murder was an accidental result of a failed robbery attempt. He claimed he had never seen Farid before, let alone been hired as a hitman for his wife. The accusations indeed seemed to be grasping at straws, with no irrefutable evidence of premeditation or a contract killing, only assumptions and interpretations of the events on the recording. Dario also confessed that he was under the influence of alcohol and prohibited substances that evening, hence his poor recollection of the event's chronology. As for Carlos, he maintained that his friend did not involve him in his plans, and everything that happened in the bar was as shocking to him as it was to those they attacked. Blon appeared to be telling the truth, but Brian's words, who made the fatal shot, raised some doubts. Consider this. He failed to commit the robbery, ended up in prison, but his sick child still received the necessary expensive treatment. Brian claimed that kind-hearted people, learning about his motive, helped him. However, the Lucas family's lawyers tried to prove that the 3,000 euros stolen from Irene, which Farid paid for her murder, were spent on the treatment. Supposedly, Brian agreed to sacrifice himself and go to prison to save his child and secretly pass the money to his wife. This version, however, was never proven. Return to Spain. Only after obtaining a court order that guaranteed his safety did Genesaris decide to return to Spain. Several months had passed since the tragedy, and the media frenzy had subsided. Upon his return, Genesaris claimed to have brought investigation materials proving his innocence in his wife's murder. He cited his main reason for returning as a desire to care for the children he shared with Irene, who had been under the care of the deceased's relatives during his absence. Six months later, Farid decided to give a major interview, in which he revealed that he had lost virtually everything. He was jobless, his passport had been annulled, preventing him from leaving the country, and to add insult to injury, his friends had turned their backs on him, and the mother and uncle of his late wife forbade him from seeing his children. Genesaris repeatedly faced Maria and Pedro Lucas in court. 
He accused them of threatening him while they attempted to prove his involvement in Irene's murder. However, neither side could substantiate their claims. Ultimately, the children remained in the custody of their grandmother and uncle, and the widower was unable to claim any of his late wife's property. This is a story of survival that is hard to put into words. The bravery of eight-year-old Jennifer Schuett is beyond measure, and her actions in critical circumstances are remarkable. It's a rare case where the victim aided in apprehending her attacker. Despite losing her ability to speak due to a horrific injury, Jennifer survived, retaining every detail. Over 19 years, she relentlessly continued to pursue her own case, and in the end, she got her way. You're hurt, man. You're hurt. You're hurt. You're hurt. You're hurt. You're hurt. Yes. Elder. No. Jennifer Schuett, an eight-year-old schoolgirl, had recently finished school. She lived with her single mother, Elaine, who did everything possible to ensure her daughter's happiness and well-being. Elaine worked multiple jobs to support the family and provide Jennifer with a joyful childhood. Surrounded by such love and care, Jennifer blossomed into a lively and cheerful child, embracing learning with enthusiasm and displaying a keen intellect and curiosity. At such a young age, children are often afraid of the dark, and Jennifer was no exception. She had a fear of the dark and frequently slept alongside her mother in the same room. As far as I can remember back in my childhood, I just get it like the dark or sleeping alone. So I found comfort in going to bed with my mom. We would all bed we had with each other. That night, on August 9th, 2009, the mother and daughter slept in the same room. Jennifer was tossing and turning, kicking her mom in sleep, making it difficult for her to fall asleep. Unusually, at 2.30 a.m., Elaine woke up and asked Jennifer to go back to her own room for the rest of the night because she needed to get up early for work. Understandingly, Jennifer responded to her mother, saying, just because I love you, Mom, I'm going to sleep in my own room tonight, and went to her room. Elaine would later regret this decision for a long time, but at that moment, she couldn't know what would happen next. The following morning, Elaine discovered that Jennifer was missing when she went to wake her up. She noticed that the window facing the parking lot was wide open. Elaine promptly called 911. Upon the police's arrival, she recounted that she hadn't heard any noise or screams after Jennifer went to her room. It is worth mentioning that their apartment was on the first floor, and the windows in Jennifer's room overlooked the parking lot, leading Elaine to fear that someone might have seen Jennifer and entered the room through the window. Elaine realized that their apartment was not the ideal living situation for her and her young daughter, but it was the best they could afford at the time. Nevertheless, Elaine's parents decided to help her and their granddaughter with a new place to live. They purchased a small house nearby and renovated it. Jennifer and her mother were supposed to move there in a few months, and they had been there the day before Jennifer went missing. They were working in the garden, where Jennifer was bitten by mosquitoes, which prevented her from sleeping peacefully that night. After her daughter's disappearance, Elaine was devastated. She said that Jennifer was all she had and pleaded for her return. The police worked tirelessly to locate her. Luckily, Elaine didn't have to wait long for news. Around 6.30 p.m. that same day, the police received a call from parents whose children were playing in a field and accidentally stumbled upon something. To their horror, they realized it was the body of a young girl. Upon arriving at the scene, the police found the body of eight-year-old Jennifer Schuett lying in the middle of the field, five kilometers from her home. Jennifer's condition was grave, but she was still breathing. Jennifer's condition was grave. Her throat had been cut from ear to ear. The main life-threatening injury for Jennifer was a wide wound on her throat, which caused her to lose a lot of blood and made her extremely pale and weak. Jennifer was taken to the hospital in critical condition, 
where doctors fought to save her life. When I first saw Jennifer in the emergency room, and she was a fairly small eight-year-old, very pale, covered with ant bites and scratches on her back. She couldn't make any sounds uh, because of the injury that she had to her neck. Fortunately, after the operation, Jennifer's condition stabilized and the bleeding stopped. We completed her surgery. Her airway is stable. She's not bleeding. So we're very hopeful uh, about her survival. When she regained consciousness after the surgery, her behavior underwent a sudden change. It turned out that she was afraid of all men. I was kind of a hard patient to deal with because I had a lot of nail doctors and I was scared of males. Additionally, the Dickinson Police Department deployed a whole team to guard her hospital room. Throughout this time, Jennifer was in a constant state of panic. She even hit a doctor in the stomach when he tried to approach her. Elaine tried to reassure her daughter, explaining that all these people were there to care for her and help her. However, Jennifer didn't trust anyone. Her behavior became more understandable when she finally revealed what had happened to her that night. We knew that we had a survivor that couldn't speak. The challenges were to, to extract information from her. Now we're, we're talking about an eight-year-old. It was difficult. Jennifer could not directly inform the investigator of anything. To obtain any information, the detectives gave her a notebook and several pens, asking her to answer questions in writing. Due to her fear of men, Jennifer wrote notes to her mother, who then passed them to the officer. Jennifer's responses were surprisingly precise, detailing the events accurately. Despite being only eight years old, she displayed remarkable intelligence for her age. She started by going into her room, turning on the light, and picking up a book to read, hoping it would help her sleep, which it did. Jennifer fell asleep. The next thing she knew, a stranger was carrying her out of the house. He was running with me, hearing me down the sidewalk, and I immediately tried to scream that he covered my nose and mouth. Afterward, he placed Jennifer in the car, claiming to be an undercover police officer. She later confessed that she immediately felt that something was wrong. Looking around, she saw her mother's car in the parking lot, so she was confused about where they were going and why. On the one hand, she knew that the police were good guys, but on the other hand, her mother had taught her not to trust strangers. As a child, I wanted to believe him, but the pride of me that he had just learned about strangers in school, the part of me that was scared of the dark knew that there was something really wrong here. As they passed her grandparents' house, Jennifer told the stranger that he could drop her off at their house, to which he replied, I can't because they're not home. And then she realized he was lying because their car was in the driveway. Later, the man stopped near Jennifer's school, about three kilometers from her home. He then said to watch the moon carefully. When it changed color, her mother would come for her. I remember anxiously waiting for the headlight, but they never am. I think that at that point, he was trying to psych himself up for her. What he really intended to kneel. Five minutes passed, and the stranger said, Well, your mom's not coming so we need to go further. They drove a few more blocks to a dead-end street where the strangers stopped the car. Jennifer tried once again to make sure he was a real policeman. I was in an interrogating hand. I was wanting him to print to me that he was a police officer. I wanted to, you know, where's your gun? Where's your badge? He told me once back that he's done with in the back feet. Jennifer turned around to search for it, and at that moment, the suspicious policeman took off her underwear. Jennifer is unsure of how long she was in the stranger's grip because she blacked out. She first regained consciousness when he was dragging her through the field by her ankles. Despite the excruciating pain from twigs and stones digging into her back, 
Jennifer pretended to be dead and stayed silent. He let go of her feet and left her in the field. Jennifer only heard him walking away. Then she heard his car door slam and him drive away. I realized I couldn't scheme and I couldn't figure out why. I had just enough strength to throw my right hand on top of my neck. And that's when I felt if a gaping wind. And I looked at my hand and I was full of glad. Since the exact time of Jennifer's disappearance is unknown, it is believed that she lay in the field for 12 to 14 hours. When the sun set, she saw the lights of passing cars. Nearby, she heard children's voices and a dog approached her several times as if trying to get the attention of its owner, but he never came. Throughout, she was bitten by fire ants, which helped her stay conscious. Any time I let him tail, I would be in disbelief that I hadn't died yet. Jennifer said she wasn't afraid and had even accepted that she might not survive, but suddenly she heard children's voices nearby, and at that moment, something hit her leg. The next time Jennifer regained consciousness, she heard a police officer repeating, if then found, you're gonna be okay, just please stay with me, please stay with me. And I remember being put into the life fight helicopter. This story was very challenging for young Jennifer as she couldn't speak and had to write everything down on paper. Moreover, her fear of men complicated the situation so her mother asked all the questions, and Jennifer's answers were relayed to the officers who were behind the door. Incredibly, eight-year-old Jennifer even managed to get the stranger's name from him. I just remember remembering his name, and so I wrote, he said his name was Dennis. I remember then that he looked to Griffey, and like he may have had a scar or something on his face. Four days after her disappearance, the police requested the services of forensic artist Lois Gibson, who communicated with Jennifer solely through gestures and notes. Despite these challenges, they managed to create an incredibly detailed composite sketch. It was shown to the public in hopes that someone would identify the man. Meanwhile, the police continued to comb through the crime scene and found Jennifer's clothing about half a mile away, along with a man's shirt and underwear. Although there was hope that DNA on the clothing would lead to the perpetrator, no matches were found. Jennifer's recovery was gradual. She showed remarkable resilience despite still being a child. There was a moment when she got upset over a chocolate bar she couldn't eat, screamed in frustration, and a faint sound escaped her mouth. Doctors were shocked because her vocal cords were almost severed and they never expected them to heal, but somehow they began to mend. I like to say I had a set up then. Soon after, Jennifer was discharged from the hospital. She not only returned home, but also went back to school. After completing her schooling and college education, Jennifer decided to pursue a career as a children's librarian. However, she never forgot what happened that night. Each day felt like a hunt for the criminal. It could be anyone. This could be our neighbor. This could be... Someone at the post office, someone at the grocery store, if he watching enough, is he going to come back and finish me off? Fortunately, Jennifer met a guy named Jonathan, and for the first time in many years, she trusted a man, and they fell in love. However, at the same time, the trail of her attacker grew colder. The chances of him being found were slim, and the case showed no progress despite being passed from one investigator to another. Eighteen years after that dreadful night, Jennifer received a phone call. I got a phone call that Detective Tim Cromie would be taking over my case and he wanted to meet with me. Tim Cromie promised to do everything possible to catch the criminal, and Jennifer believed him. And I told her, I said, Jennifer, I will do whatever I can do in my power till the end of my career. If I get you the answer that you... Tim and Richard discovered the significant amount of evidence collected on the day Jennifer went missing and immediately after she was found, with Jennifer's underwear being particularly crucial, as well as the perpetrator's shirt and underwear. They sent a DNA sample found on the clothing to Quantico, Virginia. 
Although detectives knew that technology had advanced significantly in 19 years, they understood that the case's age meant it would not be a priority in the lab. Often working cold cases, time is your enemy. People forget, people move away, people die. This was one of the benefits of time in our case was the advances of technology in the DNA field. Despite a whole year passing, their work was rewarded. The man whose DNA was found at the crime scene was Dennis Earl Bradford. Who? Who is that? The same man Jennifer had written down many years ago. It turned out that the eight-year-old girl had been incredibly accurate in her descriptions. Jennifer was eight years old, on pain medication, couldn't speak, and hand wrote down, he said his name was Dennis. At that point, it was monumental that this girl was so accurate. Of course, later we found out how accurate she was on everything. Dennis Bradford, 39, lived in North Little Rock, Arkansas, and his DNA was logged into the national database following an assault on a woman he met at a bar in 1996. Although sentenced to 12 years in prison, he only served four. On February 4, 2000, Dennis was conditionally released. Less than a year later, police arrested Bradford for driving under the influence less than half a mile from his home. He remarried and worked as a welder until his arrest in 2009. Tim Cromie and Richard Renison investigated the link between the suspect from North Little Rock, Arkansas, and the small town of Dickinson, Texas. It turned out that the man had been arrested in Dickinson in 1987, three years before Jennifer's attack. At that time, he had two addresses within two miles of Jennifer and Elaine's apartment. To confirm his identity as the kidnapper, detectives requested a 19-year-old photo from his driver's license. When they saw the picture, they were stunned. He looked like a copy of the composite sketch created with the help of eight-year-old Jennifer. You're a Kenkir for short. Yes. You're a Kishi Gum Contact with her. Yes. Told up head. No. I didn't tell her. Obviously, it's special you up, but I think you would. If you will see her, I did you need to impress her. I really did. I tried to. Because you are. Yeah, for free job on the council's up. No, I. You are. I put up that bed. But I'm not there. Oh, God. You are very bad. Yeah. Oh, well, I am. Oh, huh. Well, yeah, don't let you go for it. I have great there. Oh, hurry, your cards. Bye. No idea. Are you worried me back two nades or you're already in? Uh, and yours to not. Dennis Earl Bradford was arrested on October 19, 2009. He insisted he didn't know Jennifer, couldn't recall why he had stopped near her apartment, and couldn't comprehend why he had treated her so cruelly. Dennis also revealed an interesting detail that investigators didn't know. After the attack, he was overwhelmed with guilt, and he attempted suicide with a shotgun. Bradford wanted to pull the trigger, but changed his mind. Afterward, he was admitted to the psychiatric ward, which happened to be the same hospital that Jennifer was still in. Even at that time, he was so close to her. Immediately after the interrogation, detectives informed Jennifer that the criminal they had been searching for 19 years was arrested. Though he never met her face to face, Reese's mother was good friends with Tiffany's mother. Reese even called Kathy shortly after Tiffany's death and shared condolences for her untimely death. But once again, Reese would elude justice as police were unable to gather any clues to link him with Tiffany's murder, and the case went unsolved for quite some time. In 2015, 
investigators finally got a breakthrough in Tiffany Johnson's case. By then, DNA technology had advanced massively. A DNA swab that was taken from the state medical examiner's office during the autopsy of Tiffany was sent to the lab for DNA testing. The DNA profile got a hit in the CODIS database and implicated William Reese in the crime. In September of 2015, William Reese was charged in Oklahoma City with the 1997 kidnapping and murder of Tiffany Johnston. But just before his trial was set to begin, in an unexpected twist, he started confessing to other crimes in an attempt to cut a deal with the prosecution. <laughs> he eluded the police. I've lived for 90 years. Riley's hand criminal residual to its guilty and unhurt him. But a shades of the truth for sure. <laughs> Already suspecting him in the murder of Laura Smither and the disappearances of Jessica Kane and Kelly Cox, detectives put a bunch of photos of the three victims before him. He immediately accepted responsibility but continued to deny any sexual motive behind the crimes. But, boy, it isn't. Well, though, really, they expect me to make him build. I just need to win. I'm in. Yeah, yeah, so I act. You know, I leave in, and then I walk on with any usual eyes, if you want to roll on money, but that's the thing. He also agreed to show investigators to the site where it claimed the remains of Kelly and Jessica were buried on the condition that they would not seek the death penalty. In April of 2016, Reese led the investigators to a site in Houston Pasture where human remains were found after several days of digging. The remains were later confirmed by the Harris County Medical Examiner's offices as belonging to Jessica Kame. From there, the search moved through a burial site in Brazoria County where they found another set of human remains. Through dental records, the remains were positively identified as Kelly Cox. The trial for Tiffany Johnston's murder began in May of 2021 in the Oklahoma County District Court. On May 28, 2021, he was found guilty by the jury. On August 19, 2021, the judge sentenced him to death for Tiffany's abduction and murder. Following his conviction for murder in Oklahoma, Reese was extradited to stand trial in Texas in early March 2022 for the murders of Laura Smither, Kelly Cox, and Jessica Kane. He pleaded guilty to all three murders and was sentenced to life imprisonment in June 2022. Here's an old saying in the law. Justice the latest, justice denied. Justice will not be delayed any while we're in this case. I sit with you to death. Four families waited for decades to get answers regarding the fate of their loved ones, while the person responsible for these crimes selfishly kept these secrets to himself. It's saddening to see that he would only give these poor families the answers they so desperately needed to suit his own personal means. We can only hope that the families can finally begin the healing process and find comfort in being able to give their loved ones a proper burial after all these years. They encountered the wild guy in the wild place at the wild time. Thank you.